I grew up Baptist. Um, my parents were devout Baptists. That means they never went to church. And, but they made sure that me and my brother went every Sunday. Um, at a certain time when I got a little older, around 12 or 13, we started, there was youth groups every Friday and Saturday or every other Friday and Saturday. So, but I was going to that and I, at one time wanted to be a Baptist preacher and I was totally into the God thing and thought that was the most awesome thing in the world. But, you know, and my, I also described my, my parents during this time, my parents were the no police. So anything I wanted to do, the answer was no. But things that I wanted to do, I mean, it, my parents had a good reason for saying no. You know, like I wanted to go see all these action movies or horror movies, and my parents said no. And then I wanted to go see the Moody Blues play. No. You know, uh, anything I wanted to do, any fun, anything that I viewed as fun, the answer was no. And, you know, I equated my parents, in a sense, to God. Because God, to me, at that time, I mean, there was a time when I loved God. But then after a while, I started seeing God as he's the ruler of thou shall nots. Everything in the Bible was thou shall not. It wasn't a book of what you're allowed to do. It's what you're not allowed to do, which is what my parents did. You know, this is all the stuff you're not allowed to do. And, you know, I wanted to be religious, but it didn't seem very fruitful. It seemed like... I don't get to do anything I want to do. And then, you know, if you do something that goes against what God says to do, you get punished. Or in the Old Testament, you're killed. You know, well, my dad, you know, everything I did got me in trouble. So, you know, I'm equating both. So when I was about 10 years old, I started playing Dungeons and Dragons. Well, when I was 10 years old, I had watched a lot of movies that had magic in them. And I wanted to know, is that something I can do? Is magic real? Is that like a real, like viable, could I do this for the rest of my life? Could I do it one time? And I mean, there's M-A-G-I-C, and that's pulling a rabbit out of a hat, pulling a card trick, you know, out, doing an illusion. And then, as Aleister Crowley pointed out, satanic magic should be spelled M-A-G-I-C-K. And that's what I wanted to do. Satanic magic. Is that real? And so I decided I would try a magic spell in real life. And I thought, okay, I get a pop quiz every Friday, but I don't want to kill my teacher. I don't want her to break her leg or something. I just want a magic spell that teaches me that this works. So I did a magic spell for money. And when I did that, I went out the next day and I found a can of tennis balls with a $5 bill in it. And I thought, this is pretty awesome. This is 1976. Candy bars are about 20 cents. Comic books are 15 to 20 cents and penny candy is a penny. But maybe that was a coincidence. I'm going to do it again. So the next Friday, I did another magic spell for money. Saturday, I went out playing, found a $10 bill on the side of the road. And I thought, eight days, $15? That's not bad. I can nickel and dime my way up to being a millionaire. We had uh, spells in D&D &D books, in your gaming books. There was magic spells in them. I didn't know if those worked or not. Plus the library had books on magic, but I didn't want to be caught checking one out. So I would read them there, you know, and just hope that that actually works. And then at the same time as I'm doing that, uh, this is at 10 years old, I was in the fifth grade and we had this game at school. I learned about it the first day of class. This kid, my age, ask me to meet him in the bathroom at the first break. Well, the first break's at 10.20. And at 10.20, I saunter into the bathroom. I don't know why I'm meeting this kid there, but there's 49 other kids in the bathroom. So now there's 50 of us, 
boys and girls in the same bathroom and they say we're going to turn out the light and chant this bloody mary phrase and if you do it right the spirit of a burn victim will show up in the mirror oh that's cool i mean i doubted that worked but sure why not let's try that so somebody turns out the light and we chant the phrase and suddenly spirit of a burn victim shows up in the mirror now it's really a demon and what you've done is a spell and we did that demonic face shows up 49 screaming kids ran out of the bathroom one kid we'll say he's an idiot i can say that about a child because it was me thought that is the coolest thing in the world i said that i made that face appear that's power I want to make sure this is real. Now, at school, when we're doing this Bloody Mary thing, we had notes sent home because some kids got hurt. Like, this went through the school like wildfire. Every grade, um, every class, everybody was doing this. And some kids, like in a panic to get out of the bathroom, got trampled. So notes were sent home and they said, if you're caught playing this game at school, you'll be suspended for three days. Well, I had to take this note to my dad. You know, and like I described my dad before, my dad was a Marine. Now, at this time, he was a former Marine, but people will tell you there's no such thing as a former Marine. And my dad was kind of gruff and tough, and, you know, he calls me into the den and in his normal loving tone says, Have you been playing this game? And being terrified of my dad like I was, I told him the absolute truth. No. So instead of playing the game at school and getting caught, I played it once a day at school. I started playing it at home. So in the morning when I wake up, I'm going to play the game. Before I brush my teeth, I'm going to play it. After I brush my teeth, I'm going to play it. I'm going to use the bathroom, I'm going to play it. When I wash my hands, I'm going to play it. After breakfast, I'm going to play it. Before I leave for school, I'm going to play it. When I get home, I'm going to play it. My parents aren't going to be home when I get home, so I'm going to play it 25 times a day without fail. Because every time I did it, that face showed up. And I thought that was awesome. Well, to make a magic spell real, you need repetition, intention, and demonic presence. So I obviously had demonic presence because the demon showed up. Intention, I wanted that face to show up. And repetition, the game is repetition. You say it over and over again. But everybody in the school is saying it over and over again because we all have the intention to see this face. Now, obviously, other people were getting results because people were leaving the bathroom in a panic, screaming, and people got trampled and hurt. So I wasn't the only one getting results. You know, and if you look up the game now, it's in multiple scary movies. Um, there's a lot of YouTube videos about it. You know, there's people that know that it works. You know, as well as, you know, it's popular enough that there's a company that makes the Bloody Mary mirror, you know, that you can buy. I think the full price of that is $129. Who would possibly buy that? if they didn't know anything about it. For 10 years of my life, I watched magic movies. And I went to my Baptist preacher and my parents and asked them, is magic real? Is that something I can do? And they both said no. That magic was just something that you saw like David Copperfield do, or Doug Henning, or in a movie. Apparently, the Baptist preacher and my parents never read the 33 verses in the Bible where God says not to do magical things. So I went in the bathroom to do my magic spell. And I did the magic spell halfway into it. I'm not sure what this thing is that appears in the mirror, but I'm making it happen. Maybe this is magic. Maybe there's some way to harness this power. 
So halfway into my magic spell, I stopped and I did the Bloody Mary chant. And when this face appeared, I let it know I was doing a spell for money. Now, this thing never talked to me. I didn't know if it could hear me. I just, you know, I was 10 years old and just assumed if it's there, it can hear me. You know, so I did the finished out my magic spell. And the next day I went out to play and I found what looked like Monopoly money rolled up tight in rubber bands. I stuck that in my pocket and went back to playing. And then later that night, after I've had my bath and, you know, everybody's in bed, going to bed and sleeping, I'm sitting in my bedroom with a sheet over my head and a flashlight in my mouth, checking out what is this money? What have I found? I don't know that it's money. It looks like Monopoly money. Well, it looked like Monopoly money because I had never seen a $100 bill. And then when I unraveled all the rubber bands and all the bills, I had 10 $100 bills. So it's 1976. All my stuff is dirt cheap and I'm worth a thousand bucks. I know for a fact that magic works. This is something I can do every day for the rest of my life. And as 10 years old, I'm thinking if I did this every day for three years, I'd be a millionaire. If I did this every day for one year, I could own a Lamborghini, which was the car I wanted. I wanted a Lamborghini Countach. There's probably over 10,000 covens in the world, but when you, when it comes down to it, there's two basic types of Satanism. There's atheistic and theistic. So atheistic would be Church of Satan or the Satanic Temple. And they believe in Satan is an idea. That's your morality, um, uh, the Christian's morality. And they're not interested in having your morals put on them. And they believe in pretty much straight up hedonism. They should be allowed to do whatever they want to do as long as it doesn't hurt somebody else. There's not really a Satan to an atheistic Satanist, but to the atheistic Satanist, there's also no God. There's no saints because there's no heaven. There's no hell. There's no demons. There's no angels. None of that is real. Now to a theistic Satanist, I was a theistic Satanist. I grew up in the Baptist church, so I believed in God. But when you become a Satanist, it's a little different because like there's a coven called the joy of Satan and the joy of Satan on their website talks about God is the bad guy and Satan is the good guy. And they have like um, a manifesto on there about how they come to this conclusion. Like they quote the Bible and they talk about how that, you know, this is proof that God is the bad guy. And this is proof that Satan is the good guy. And, you know, if you're a Satanist and you believe in God, you usually have a skewed version of what God is like. Or also, as well, a skewed version of what the devil is like. You see the devil as a good guy. You don't see hell as a punishment. You see it as all the fun people are going to be there. Now, you see that when you first start out. The longer you stay in Satanism, the more you see the truth, or at least a version of the truth. You know, you eventually come to realize one day you're going to be burning in hell. But the devil is giving you a lot of what you want here. Now, he doesn't give you everything you want. You do a spell for money and you're doing it for $220,000. You can buy a Lamborghini and you get a thousand bucks. You know, you do it for a million dollars, you might also get a thousand bucks. You might also not give you anything. You know, there's a spell, there's many different types of spells, but there's one called a hex. And in the two covens that I was in, if you do a hex, it has to come with an abortion because a hex is the top level of curse you have. But for you to get the devil's attention, for him to give you what you want, you've got to give the devil what he wants. And what he wants is destruction of the most innocent thing in the world. And that would be a baby. So if you can murder a baby, he'll give you what you want. Almost exactly what you want. But, you know, you've, 
you've got to pull out all the stops and be willing to do something like that to get it. When I was 11 years old, I became the victim of a sexual assault at school at the hands of a female teacher. She told me that was my idea. I wanted to do it. Obviously, I enjoyed myself. And that if I told anybody, I would be expelled from school and I would probably go to prison and because it's a sexual assault and I believe everything my teachers tell me. And they could have told me pretty much anything when I was 11 years old and I'd have been like, okay, you know, yeah, that's true. Um, so, but I'm not allowed to tell anybody. I'm, I'm not allowed to tell my parents. If I tell my parents, they'll disown me, disinherit me and help send me to prison. So I don't want any of that to happen to me. At 12 years old, this other 12 year old kid, we thought he moved away because he was gone. Like we didn't see him for two years. And then suddenly he's back and we thought he moved back to town, but it turned out he'd been homeschooled for the last two years. And he talked about that he belonged to a group that played D&D that also thought magic was real. Well, I know magic is real. So I decide that I'm going to join this group. At least I'm going to go and check them out and see what they do. And, you know, at my house, we had um, about a, probably a 26 inch TV, but there they had a 50 inch projection screen TV. And at my house, we could watch G rated movies and PG rated movie, if it had been vetted by my dad. But over there, we could watch G rated movies, PG rated movies, R rated movies, X rated movies, triple X rated movies, triple X rated movies with kids in at my age. And I was told that what happened to me when I was 11 years old was horrible and terrible. And that should have never happened to anybody. But now, I can get my power back. We don't have power, but 12 years old, what do I know? They said that I can be in those movies if I want to. Anybody that I don't feel comfortable being with, I don't have to do it. Anybody that I want to do, no one can turn me down. Huh. Okay. So I was in child pornography from the age of 12 to halfway through being 16. Most of the kids were about my age. Some of them were adults. So it wasn't always children, but we were all filmed and all this stuff was sold. I didn't get the benefit of the money from any of that, but I thought I was having a good time. Never occurred to me when I was a child that I was being re-victimized every time. It didn't, I didn't think that was bad or wrong or, you know, I'm getting to have sex. I'm a kid. This is fantastic. All my friends at school, I mean, not girls. Girls did not talk like this. But all the boys at my school all talked about getting laid, having sex on the weekend, doing something with somebody. You know, and looking back, we were all making up stories. None of us were doing any of that stuff except me. I was legitimately in pornography. When I was 13 years old, when it was just before I turned 13, this older kid came up to me and he said, you know you're in a satanic coven, right? And I just laughed it off. But a couple of weeks later, I was really bothered by that. And I went up to an adult that I trusted. And I said, hey, you're going to laugh, but I heard this was a satanic coven. Crazy, right? And he said, it is. And my heart sunk into my stomach. And I said, I, I, I'm not a member, am I? And he says, no. Would you like to be? I see, I have a lot of people ask me, why would you join a satanic coven? You're 12 years old. Well, because in my satanic coven, I found out that the perfect time to smoke a cigarette is right after you eat. The perfect time to smoke dope is right before you eat. The perfect time to take some acid is on the weekend. The perfect time to take MDMA is when you're with your friends. Or you can take MDMA and acid at the same time. It's called candy flipping. 
And it's an amazing feeling. And I'm loving all these things. And I'm thinking, you know, you've got to be 18 years old to buy porn. I'm addicted to porn. I'm still 12 years old, so I can't buy porn. You gotta be 19 years old to buy cigarettes. I'm still 12. You gotta be 21 to buy booze. I'm still 12. So, and I'm having sex pretty much every weekend, sometimes during the week. If I quit, I'm not gonna be able to do that anymore. And I'm also I'm on all these drugs I don't know where to get those. I get them there. So I decided I wanted to join because, you know, whereas my parents tell me no to everything I want to do, this place takes me out to see the Moody Blues. They take me out to see Kiss, to see Ted Nugent, to see Alice Cooper. Any place I want to go, any movie I want to see, nothing is off limits. I asked them what I had to do to become a Satanist, and they told me there were 13 steps involved to becoming a Satanist. Um, I had done almost all of them already. All I had left to do was that I had to slice my left thumb and bleed onto a document. And the document says, the blood of Jesus washes away all sin, but not mine. And I signed my name to that. And on another page, it says, Jesus died for everyone, but not me. And I sign my name to that. On the final page of a five page document, I agreed to sell my soul to the devil. But I'm not positive that the devil is real. I'm not positive that there is a hell. I'm not positive there's a heaven or even really a God. Besides signing this document, you show up to a coven meeting and this is at night, and my parents think I'm at a sleepover. And I'm dressed in a white robe. It signifies you're losing your innocence, and you are baptized full submersion in a vat of human blood, pig's blood, and urine, human urine. They do full submersion, bring you up, you go into another room, take a shower, come out in a black robe with the cowl raised. It signifies you've been baptized into a world of darkness. You sit in a chair and they read off the document you signed the night before. Then you show them your thumb to show that it was your thumb that they sliced open. And you know, that is your blood that's in that document. Um, they read off everything and they hand you a crucifix inside of a wheel. You spin the crucifix upside down, signifying human sacrifice. You grab the arms of the crucifix and break them downward denouncing Christ. And then they intertwine the document you signed with this crucifix. And they say that you've now sold your soul, that it's official, you're a Satanist, and you have a big party after that. Now you're celebrating that you're officially a Satanist, but the reality of what just happened is that you're celebrating that one day you're going to die and go to hell. And I was officially a Satanist at that point. At 14 years old, I was told that I was going to celebrate, I was going to have a party with a woman. It's going to be a sex party. It was going to be all the males between 12 and 15 years old and this one female. And the purpose of that was to make her pregnant because we were going to do an abortion in eight or nine months. And I said, cool. And then I went home and looked up the word abortion because I didn't know what it meant. And my dictionary was so old, the word abortion was not in it. So I looked it up at the library. There were two books on abortion. They were both about this thick. I went through school on cliff notes. I am not reading 300 pages to get the definition of abortion. So I went back to my coven and I asked, hey, you know, I was told I had to do an abortion, but I don't know what that means. And they said, oh, you're killing a baby in the womb. I was like, is that legal? He was yeah, in the womb, legal, out of the womb, murder. Okay. So I practiced with Plato and a scalpel 
or an apple and a scalpel for a few months. I don't even know if I'm doing the right thing. This is what they told me to do. Then on the day of the abortion, I was told that my goal was to get blood on my hands. However it gets there. And she was 19 years old and this was her, I think her second or third abortion. She was what's called a breeder. A breeder intentionally gets pregnant so that she can get abortions. Because she's given, she'll be given some kind of status in the satanic coven at some point, whenever her body stops being able to produce babies. All of our abortions, for the most part, are late term. A late term abortion is performed by you deliver all the baby except the head. You leave the head inside, you take a pair of scissors, and you jam it up into the base of the skull. You then take the scissors and open them up. So it opens the base of the skull. You stick a catheter into the skull, suck the brain out. Then you pull the scissors out. Then you dismember the body. Sometimes you don't dismember the body. If you're in the abortion clinic, I don't think they dismember at this point. They usually dismember when it's still inside the womb. But as a satanic coven, we dismembered the body right there threw it out to some Satanists on the floor that are swaying and chanting our bodies ourselves, and they consumed the body. They ate it. They cannibalized it. I totally did 146 assisted abortions. Uh, my job is to get blood on my hands, whether that's the baby or the mother, and I'm not actually doing the abortion, but I'm there. Um, but my belief also is that the receptionist that works in Planned Parenthood and the armed guard that's outside in the parking lot and the guy that quite possibly even the maintenance crew that decides they're going to mow the grass and make the abortion clinic look nice are just as culpable as the abortion doctor and nurse inside killing the baby because you're all assisting him to do his job. So I was just as culpable as the doctor and the nurse that performed the abortion, even though I didn't do it. You know, it's a horrific place. How somebody could decide that this is okay? You know, like you're Catholic and then you vote for a president that is in favor of abortion. It's like, what's wrong with you? You can't do this. This is so satanic. Yeah, the, the first one I did, I was 14. I was three months before turning 15. And, you know, the spells that I'm doing at this point, a hex, I think the mayor, but I'm not sure if it was the mayor, wanted something passed that he tried every avenue to get it passed and he couldn't. So he came to my coven to see if we could do a hex, get it done, and figuring that the abortion would push it through. And I guess whatever it is that he wanted to get done, passed. I'm having fun. I'm having a great time. Um, however, when I was 13 years old, I tried to kill myself for the first time. And I just got so, you know, thinking about what happened to me when I was 11, I was on drugs a lot. And thinking about what I was going through now. And then uh, for whatever reason, you know, at that time I tried to, I was, you know, 13 years old, you're not the brightest bulb in the box. I, I tried to OD on like Tylenol or something like that, which made me really sick and really bad headache. When I was 17 years old, I tried to kill myself again because for four and a half years, I'd been a porn star and everybody wanted to see me perform. When I was 16 and a half years old, I grew a mustache and now suddenly I aged out of porn. Nobody wanted to see a little kid with a mustache performing. So now suddenly no more movies, no more weekends, no more of that whatsoever. Nobody wants to see me anymore. And I went from being on top of the world 
to having the weight of the world on my back. You know, I can't do this stuff anymore. I can't be on film anymore. I can't be popular anymore. And I became so despondent over what was happening to me, like how bad my life had gone, that I wanted to end it all. When I was 18 years old, I graduated from high school and I thought, all right, I need to, when I go off to college, I want to join another satanic coven. But how am I going to do that? I mean, they're not going to advertise in the town square. And, you know, this is before the internet. So, you know, that the places that you could find satanic covens back then was either on a bulletin board in certain stores or in swingers magazines in adult bookstores. So, when I went to school though, I discovered that they, I found it because they advertised it in the town square. We had a student union. Every Wednesday, the student union was open. And they had the Baptist and the Catholic Student Union, the Republican and the Democrat Student Union, the Satanist Student Union. So I went to that for the first time and found out it was kids away from home for the first time with no adult supervision. Thought Satan was all about taking drugs, drinking, and having sex. I've been doing that since I was 12 years old. I don't need a satanic coven for that anymore. And these guys would like make up magic spells on the spot. Like, we're going to do this, this, and this. Pull up! Magic works! Look at that! This magic wouldn't work and they weren't really doing a magic spell. And then these guys would go to their coven meeting on Saturday night. Sunday they'd go to church. Not a satanic church. This was like a club meeting. We're going to have fun and get drunk. And then tomorrow we're going to go to church. We're going to go to the Baptist church or the Presbyterian church or whatever they belong to, and uh, worship God and not let God know that we're in a satanic coven. I was like, that's not what I want. My coven was a real coven. So I contacted my first coven, you know, and I said, hey, I heard there's a coven out there that wants to rule the world. I want to rule the world. How do I join them? And they said there's a, a satanic coven called the World Church of Satan or Satan's World Church. Same coven. And we're going to give you the address. I'm going to go meet these guys, see what you think. And they are out to rule the world. Okay. So I'm at this coven meeting. It's a party. It's like the size of a giant Walmart. And I mean, there's 10,000 people in there partying. And I see this guy. Now let's go back to me being 13 years old. I was at a sleepover one night. And I saw this guy. I got up at like 3 in the morning to go to the bathroom. Get a drink of water. And there was this guy in the coven. He's not a member of my coven as far as I know. But he looks like he's dressed in like kind of an old school tuxedo. Top hat. Had a wand. And had corpse paint on his face. He looked like a member of KISS wearing a tuxedo. And I thought, that's the coolest look ever. And when he sees me, he winks at me. And we go our separate ways. I do what I got up to do, and then I go back to bed. The next day, I ask my covenant members, hey, I saw this guy last night. He looked like a guy from Kiss wearing a tuxedo. Who is that? Oh, you dreamed that. That didn't really happen. Okay. All right. So they're going to lie to me. I'm going to store that back here. And one day, I'm going to see that look again. And I'm going to find out what it is. So one day happened when I was 18. I'm at this party and I see a similar look. Not the same guy, but a very similar look. And I grabbed the first guy close to me and I said, Who is that? What is that? How can I do that? And he said, Well, who ran your satanic coven? I said, We had a really large satanic coven. It had between 120 and 150 members. And we had 13 high priests and priestesses. Why, who runs it here? And he said, well, we have a CEO and a board of directors. It's kind of run like a 
big corporate business. And then we have, that guy is called the High Wizard. And the High Wizard does the official magic of the coven. Well, I did the official magic of my other coven. You have the white robe is the initiate that first comes in. You want to get the black robe, which is a black robe with a red inverted pentagram on it. And that's all the satanic members have that. But the official magic practitioner wears a red robe with a black inverted pentagram. And that's the robe I wanted. And I got it as soon as I was in. First day I was a member, I got the red robe. They knew that I loved magic, that I was consumed by it. So now I find out that in this coven, the high wizard does the official magic. And I said, how many of them are there? There's between two and five in the world, but the number could be as low as one or as high as 10. And they do the official magic of the coven. And I think that is the most awesome thing. How do I get to do that? He didn't know. Like, okay. So I decided I would join this coven. I gave them the references from my previous coven. And I found out while I was in there that to become the high wizard, you've got to get Satan's attention. All right. Well, I knew that that abortion, I'm certain got Satan's attention. Like doing one, you feel 10 foot tall and bulletproof. You feel like nothing can happen to you. You are king of the world. But you are pretty certain Satan granted us pretty much everything we ever did an abortion for. So if he's granting what we're petitioning for, he knows that we're doing the abortion because he knows that we had to do the abortion for him to grant us our petition. So that's where I'm going to get Satan's attention. I'm going to do more abortions. So I started doing that. I did that 18, 19, and 20. When I was 20 years old, I got this letter in the mail and it said that I was being petitioned to come before the CEO and the board of directors. Now, something else I know is that there are people that get that and they go before the CEO and the board of directors and they are never heard from again. And I thought, I ain't going out like no sucker. So at that time, Florida had a two week calling off period to buy a handgun. I did the two week cooling off period. I went in and I bought a six hour nine millimeter and a few clips because I thought, you gonna try and do something to me? I might die, but I ain't going out alone. So I brought all this in with me. You know, I'm wearing this under my clothes and I go in for this meeting. And when I go in, I sit, I'm sitting in this chair and they bring in this light blue high wizard handbook. It's as hokey as it sounds. The cover is a hand drawing of a high wizard. And all the way through it, is animation of high wizards. But then the first page, when you open it, on the first page, the first thing it says, no one can tell you what to do. This is the job for me. This is what I want. I mean, I can do anything. They're like, absolutely anything. Anything you want to do, you won't be arrested. You won't be charged with anything. Nothing will happen to you. There's no jail time. There's nothing, anything you want to do. You want to speed down the road everywhere you go, do it. Now I thought this has got to be far-fetched. There's got to be something that I can be charged with. But I thought I want this job. Now they also showed me a wall. They moved a curtain back and there was about nine different costumes on the wall. It was nine different variations of what a high wizard might want to look like. There was also different face paint, different things you could do. You know, and I thought, this is super cool. So I just any version of this, or I can make up my own look pretty much. As long as it's an old school tuxedo. I mean, you can wear a modern tuxedo, but why would you? It's an old school tuxedo, a top hat, a wand or a cane. I thought a wand was kind of hokey, but a cane, I could bring some class to that. And I decided, yes, 
I'm going to be the first high, I'm going to be the high wizard, not the first high wizard, but I'm going to be a high wizard. I was 21 years old and I became a high wizard. Now your very first assignment, at least mine, because um, I turned 21 in July and also in July is the cremation of care ceremony that happens at Bohemian Grove. That's in California. And I got invited to that. Now, I don't know what that is. I, I'd heard of Bohemian Grove. I read it in a book about something else that happened. And the person said they went to Bohemian Grove. No idea what that is. And I go to that and they have what's called the cremation of care. Now, have you ever been a bowler? Okay, bowling used to take place, scoring used to take place on a piece of paper with a pencil. And superstitious bowlers would tell you, build me a wall. So just like Donald Trump, build me a wall. Um, when you're keeping score, if you're having a bad game, you take a pencil and you darken it in on one of the lines to build a wall so that no bad luck in your game happens beyond this wall. Cremation of care is like that. It's a ceremony that takes place that ends your bad luck for the year and gives you good luck from here until next year for the next cremation of care. It's a mock ceremony of the murder of a young boy. Bohemian Grove's been there for a long time. I'm sure that back when it started, which I'm pretty sure was in the 1800s, I'm pretty sure they had actual murders of children. But when I was a high wizard, they hook electrodes up to a child's genitalia and they shock him so bad he screams and passes out. Um, Bohemian Grove is a two week thing that happens in July. Uh, it's a lot of rich people and a lot of um, politicians. Um, I mean, a lot of them. There's things on YouTube about um, President Nixon saying that he didn't want to go back because there were too many homosexuals there. You are given places to stay. So it looks like when you leave the house, this is your mansion. This is your rock star pad. You know, you're given a car. My real car back then, when I left Satanism, my real car was a Nissan Sentra. And it wasn't even new. You know, it was early 90s edition and I left in 99. Um, but for a while when I was I Wizard, I drove a Lamborghini Diablo thinking I'm the coolest guy in the world. Look at my car. There was a time when I had $87 million in my bank account. None of it was mine. My real bank account on any given time usually had about 200 bucks in it. Sometimes less, sometimes a little more. But if you saw my high wizard bank account, I look like I'm doing quite well. I'm driving a Lamborghini, I'm staying in a mansion, I got $87 million. And I'm meeting politicians, I'm meeting anybody that wants a spell done that can afford me. But you don't give the money to me, I don't see it. It goes to my coven. So spells cost anywhere from probably 10 or $20,000 for something simple up to could be millions. I did a spell. I was told that I was hired by the three major television stations and that they paid anywhere between $500 million and $1 billion for me to do a spell that would make sure that every TV show in the future has a gay character and that they're everybody's favorite character. It's the favorite uncle, the wittiest aunt, um, the funniest, the most handsome, the best role they get, all the Emmys. Everybody loves them. And I thought, that is never going to happen. I mean, I'm a high wizard back from 1987 to 1999. This was not a popular time to be gay. So I'm thinking my coven just made a billion dollars on this spell 
and these people are never going to get this. Now, the unfortunate thing about now, other than EWTN, name a show that doesn't have a gay character. When I was a Satanist, you have to imagine organized Satanism as three houses. Two houses are back to back. One house is at the end. And all these houses have privacy fences up around them. So each house only thinks they are the only house. One house attacks the Baptist church because in the early days, up until the 1990s, the Baptist church was very strong in their faith. They were very, they were anti-gay marriage, obviously. Everybody was anti-gay marriage back then. They were anti-abortion. They were very conservative. Women wore dresses all the way down to the floor. They just preached that, you know, nobody can live together unless they're married. They just had very strict morals. And they really believed in fighting the devil. Now, it was kind of strange, though, because there was a, um, a philosophy there that kind of contradicted each other. Because on the one hand, they believed in prayer. Prayer was the number one thing. You had to pray. Intercessory prayer, praying for somebody else, praying against satanic attack. But we were also taught that Jesus defeated the devil on the cross 2,000 years ago, so he's no threat anymore. And that the devil is afraid of the Baptist church. Now, why would he be afraid of the Baptist church, but not afraid of God? Remember that he attacked God on God's own turf and had his butt handed to him by St. Michael. So St. Michael kicked him out of heaven. He's not afraid of God enough to attack him, but he's afraid of the Baptist church. So, you know, if you think the devil is afraid of you, that gives him carte blanche to attack you all he wants because you don't believe that's the devil. There's three teams that split Baptist churches. There's a sex scandal team, and that's usually a 15 or 16 year old girl sleeping with the, the Baptist preacher or the minister of music or the minister of youth. Um, then there's also a monetary scandal and there's a gossip scandal. My team did the gossip scandal. Now you're not going in there by yourself. You have a whole team of people that work on this and you're working multiple churches at the same time. So let's say you go in, let's say that I'm the person that goes in. I'm going to be the main person here, but that doesn't mean I'm working alone. There could be 20 people going in. When I show up, I show up in town and I've got a bank account that has $87 million in it. And the bank president is also a Baptist. And we already know all this stuff. Research has been done. We've studied these people in advance. You've got a schedule, you know, you've got a schedule to follow. You go in, you've got a nice car. You just bought the most ostentatious house in town. And you tell them you're looking for a new Baptist church to start to join. So he invites you to join his church. So you go in and before you get there, he's already let everybody know. This guy drives a Lamborghini. He's got $87 million. He just brought the, bought the Brewster house. You know, it's like that eyesore back, you know, wherever it is, but it's gigantic and he's got money. We should make him an official member of one of the committee. Um, Baptist churches are run on committees. So you go in and your very first day of meeting the committee, you hear the president say something, but you notice that the vice president rolls his eyes when he said it. Now, you're trained to pick up on this stuff. You're trained to know who doesn't like who. Like, the majority of the time, the president is a voted-in position. So most likely, the president won, and he appointed the vice president. The vice president was probably also winning, running for president, and he lost. But he had some good ideas. So the president assigns him the vice president position. 
But the vice president has resentment because once you're in this position, it's for life. And the only way you can move up is he has to either move, quit, or die. You know you can't kill him, so you have to bide your time until he leaves. And that might not be for 30 or 40 years. So you're stuck playing second fiddle to this guy, wishing that he would leave. So I go out and I hang out with the president. He takes me out on his new bass boat. And he tells me, well, this guy believes this and this, but, you know, and, and I think he's kind of lazy, but it's all good. So it's all good is his catchphrase. I pick up on that. And he says that a few times during that trip. It's all good. So then when I go hang out with the vice president, we hang out for a little bit and I say, hey, you know, I'm new here and I don't want to cause any trouble. There's a lie because I do want to cause trouble. But I tell him, you know, um, I was talking to the president and he said this and this about you. But it's all good. Now, most likely what I just said is a complete lie. He didn't say that. But the vice president thinks he did because I ended it with, but it's all good. And the president uses that phrase all the time. So I keep talking away with all the different members. And I tell all of them stuff that somebody might have really said, or maybe they didn't really say it. But I always say, you can't say anything to anybody, because if you say something, they're going to know I said it, because he told me. Now, once I have put in all the different spices and stirred the pot up really good, then I go to the Baptist preacher. I have a meeting with him, and I tell him, listen, I'm new here, and I don't want to cause any trouble. But this is what's going on in this committee that you put me on. You know, this person says this, this person says that, this person's doing this, this person's doing that. You know, and I, I don't really, I'm not sure what's going on here. I don't know what I should do. The Baptist preacher thanks me for coming to him and telling him these things. And then, he's a good shepherd. He's going to have to go behind my back and ask them all if they really said these things. Well, when I tell the things that I tell him are all true. I don't lie to him. No, I tell him I don't want to start any trouble there. That's a lie. But every quote I give him is an actual quote. So when he goes behind my back and talks to all these people, they all confirm. Yeah, we said that. Yeah, I said that about this person or that person or, you know, whatever it is. They all confirm these things. So from the Baptist preacher's perspective, everyone's got a bad problem with gossiping talking about people behind their back, the only person that seems to be telling him the truth is me. So he goes to the president. Now, the way the devil sets this up, if the president steps down, this whole problem goes away. It's just the way it works. If the president steps down, all the infighting goes away. And so the pastor asked him, listen, you know, if you step down, everything would be fine. But this is when that guy realizes this was a popularity contest and I won. I ain't going nowhere. And the vice president realizes if he doesn't go anywhere, I can't move up. So in his frustration, he leaves the committee. He quits. Now, Here's what the devil counts on. If the vice president leaves the committee, half the people will be on the side of the vice president and the other half are with the president. And there's overwhelming evidence that if the vice president quits, the committee will split. And if the committee splits, the church will split. Half the people approximately stay at the church Half the people approximately quit. Now it could be more or less of 50%, but that's pretty close. The people that leave are going to try and start their own church. 
if that church is not up and going in one year, it's never going to be up and going. The people that stayed are never going to grow because on Sunday or Monday, Sunday, you go to the Baptist church. Monday, you're at the water cooler. Where'd you go to church yesterday? Such and such Baptist church. Oh, you don't want to go there. They had a scandal. Well, now you have to quit because there's a scandal there. The people that left, they can't get one going because they have a scandal attached to them. So some of those people, if they get a church going, that's never going to grow. It's going to be that group of people and it's never going to expand from there. Some people are going to be reabsorbed back into the community and go to other churches. And some people are going to go back to the original church. But some people are going to have a sour taste in their mouth about religion and never go back. Satan goes for the split. He doesn't want the church destroyed. He doesn't want everyone to leave. He doesn't want the building to be crumbled. He just wants a split. And that was my job. That was one of my jobs. Uh, I, it was, there was an art to doing it. And, you know, if you did it right, when you left, you were still the good guy. You know, no one suspected it was you. No one, you know, the Baptist preacher sure doesn't suspect it was you because everything you told him was the truth. We stopped attacking the Baptist church in the 1990s because they accepted homosexuality. They accepted abortion. Their miniskirts, you know, they, they stopped wearing floor length dresses. They started wearing miniskirts to church. So we watered down their faith and they just, we, we stopped attacking them. Well, in 1999, I was tired of going to Bohemian Grove. It's not just open once a year, it's open four times a year. And I was um, tired of going. I was tired of partying with rock stars. I was tired of doing drugs every day. I was tired, I mean, you'd think that, you know, people talk about, well, if I could have sex with anybody I wanted to all the time, I'd love that. You love it at first. You know, I, I compare all my sinning to working in a candy store. All your sins, all the sins in the world are sold. It's all the candy that's in a candy store. Not just a candy store that's in the mall, but like a freestanding building, a 10,000 square foot candy store. You've got a million different pieces of candy and that's all the sins there are in the world. And you're thinking your first day on the job, how many pieces of candy am I going to have today? And how many... How long is it going to take me to try every piece of candy in the store? Now, not the licorice because nobody wants that. So, I mean, there are some sins that are disgusting. You're not going to do all the sins, but all the sins you want to do, how long will that take? Well, in six months, you've had all the candy you wanted to try. I've had even the licorice and after three years, I'm wondering why can't my boss make a new sin? How come there's no new candy coming out? And then a new candy bar comes out and it's very exciting. And you run and you take that candy bar off the wall and you tear into it and it's the same old candy, just in a new wrapper. Crack cocaine comes out. This is the most awesome thing in the world. It's a new drug. I'm going to try it. And I do. And then I realize that it's still cocaine. And after seven years, this job sucks. No part of this job is enjoyable. I don't like sinning anymore. I sin because it's expected. I'm supposed to be the biggest sinner in the world. I'm the high wizard. Not fun. Having sex, not fun. Getting drunk, not fun. Can't drink, can't get drunk anymore. If I, get dr if I drink enough to get drunk, I'm going to kill myself. Same thing with drugs. Can't get high anymore. This is just not enjoyable. Yeah, you can do anything you want, but after a while, what's left? You've had all the candy in the store. There's nothing left to do that's enjoyable. So I got a doctor's appointment with a satanic doctor. Said I had a problem, wanted to come see him. And I chose that doctor because he was on the outside of town. So I'd have to get on the highway to get to him. But instead of getting off, I just kept going. I drove a certain distance, ran out of gas, parked on the side of the road, hitchhiked into town the next day, 
sold my car for scrap, bought a ticket to go into a um, Greyhound ticket, trying to get into Canada. Because for some reason, I'd never done hardly anything in Canada as a Satanist. So for some reason, I thought I could hide in Canada. It didn't occur to me that, you know, Satan is everywhere, practically. And um, so I get rejected at the border. They told me I could go anywhere I wanted. So I did the Baptist thing. I opened up the Atlas, closed my eyes, put my finger down, landed on Oklahoma. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go to Oklahoma. And I lived there for three years. A couple of those years lived off the grid. And I bought a car and I tried to get back into Canada and I got rejected at the border again. And a friend told me that there's a border crossing near Vermont and that there's no border guard there and I can just drive straight across. I'm going to do that. So I'm heading that way. I'm two hours away, according to my GPS. And I get really sleepy. I mean, like beyond tired. And I pull over at a rest stop and I take a nap. Except when I took my nap, it was in the afternoon. And when I woke up, it was the next morning. No big deal. I'm two hours away. So I get in my car, go to the bathroom, get in my car, drive back. I'm crossing the border and I get pulled over by a border guard. He's not supposed to be there. And he has me get out of my car and he searches my car inside and out, top to bottom. And the whole time he's doing that, he's describing how that he's been trying to get this job for three years. And today is his very first day on the job. And I thought at that moment, God has a sense of humor. So I'm worth $18 and I have half a tank of gas. So I drove to Burlington, Vermont. My first day in town, I got a job. I was homeless for the first probably few weeks but I got a job my first day in town. And in Burlington, if you look at the travel magazines, it is the least religious state in the nation. Now by least religious, they mean Christian. There's not a whole lot there. But if you want to be pagan, you want to be a Wiccan or a shaman or a Druid, you can go to college and learn that. You want to be a Satanist even. Anything you want to do, you want to practice this out in public, and wear your magical garb out so everybody can see it, it's totally acceptable. So I started doing that. Now, I didn't tell anybody, hey, I belong to a satanic coven. I kind of neglected that, but I love magic and I'm addicted to magic. I still want to do it. I still love it. So I'm doing that all the time. Now, you know, when I lived in Oklahoma, it's kind of like the belt buckle of the Bible belt. If you're going to practice magic, you've got to go in your house, go in your bedroom, shut the door and lock it. So no one walks in on you because it's greatly frowned upon. But in Vermont, not frowned upon whatsoever. So I'm doing that and I'm pretty much enjoying myself. One night I did a magic spell. The next day I went to work. And I work at the largest kiosk in the mall. And it's a place called Piercing Pagoda. It's a jewelry store that's owned by Zales. And I open the store. I'm doing my job. I'm working my day at the kiosk. And this woman comes up and she presents that she wants to buy a pair of gold hoop earrings. And I present her with the perfect pair based on her description. And she agrees that is the perfect pair. And we're about to close the deal when she says, you know, actually, I'm shopping with my daughter. And when I'm done, I'll come back and buy these. Now, I know woman speak. I've been a retail manager for a few years. And I know that when a woman says that, what she means is, I'm going to go find it cheaper someplace else. But she had an honest face. Like, you just, I knew that everything she said, she meant it. She was coming back. So I put them up near the register. And three hours later, this woman comes back and we finish out the transaction. We do the deal. I get the money. She gets the gold. And I tell her at that time we were having this um, contest. If you call the 800 number on this receipt and take a survey, you might win a thousand dollars. And she says, that's fantastic. I've got something for you too. 
and she reaches in her purse. And I'm thinking, oh no, she's going to pull out a Jack Chick pamphlet, tell me that I'm sinning, that I need to drop to my knees and beg for forgiveness. But these are all things I can't do. I sold my soul when I was 13 years old. Can't drop to my knees. I can't ask God for anything because my soul is, you know, throughout, I'm damned. So instead she pulls out this little cheap gold colored piece of tin. I work at Piercing Pagoda. I recognize cheap jewelry because we sell it. It's nice jewelry, but it's not expensive. Like our most expensive item is like 50 bucks. So, and then she says the weirdest thing I'd ever heard. Now, remember that I was the high wizard. Could have been between two and five, as low as one, high as 10. And I partied with rock stars. I helped about 1,200 rock stars sell their souls. You give somebody unlimited booze and drugs that can write poetry and songs, and they will say some strange stuff. If you doubt that statement, go outside and turn on the radio to some top 40 station and just listen to like three songs in a row and see how nonsensical the things are they sing about. I mean, back then, when I left my satanic coven, I think the top song of the country, maybe of the world, was Bow It to Ba by Kid Rock. The chorus of that song is Bow It to Ba, to Dang to Dang, Diggy Diggy, Up Jumps the Boogie. That was the number one song of the year. That apparently was better than every other song that came out that year. This woman said something that to me was weirder than that. She said, the Blessed Mother is calling you into her army. And I thought, Blessed Mother, Isis, Gaia. I grew up Baptist. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but we have zero titles for the Blessed Mother. And as well, we have the name of Mary. Don't want to know what other names we have? Zero. Speaking of that, do you know what Mary did in the Baptist church? She gave birth to Jesus. Do you know what else she did? Nothing. We don't know about the wedding at Cana because Jesus turned water to wine and you can't drink wine in the Baptist church. And she also escaped to Egypt with Joseph. We didn't hear about that either because they don't want to put any spotlight on Mary. So, and then she says it's very powerful. Hmm, this isn't powerful. You know, and I just kind of go back to my happy place. You know, like, how do these people all find me? There must be a sign above my head. It's giant. It's made of neon. And it says, crazy people come here. And there's an arrow pointing straight down to me. Because they all find me. How do they find me? That sign has got to be the only answer I know. And I'm tuning her out. I'm just like, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know how this keeps happening to me. And she's just rattling on and on and on. I don't know what she's saying because I tuned her out. And eventually I think, I have your money. You have my gold. This was win-win for both of us. Why are you still standing here? And I tune her back in. And just in time for her to say, it's very powerful. Mm -mm. No, I was the high wizard. The number could have been as high as 10, but it also could have been as low as one. Out of 7 billion people, I could have been the only one high wizard. That, whatever that is, that blessed miraculous metal, is not going to touch me. There's no power, no mystique to that. Give me that. I stick my hand out for it. She's all giddy. She's happy. She's a little schoolgirl. She's like, no, she's not a little schoolgirl, but you know, she's happy like a little schoolgirl. She drops it in my hand and I clench my fist around it. All ready to tell her these things. Now, my plan, I'm going to toss it on my floor or slam it on my counter. And I'm going to tell her this is worthless. I don't feel anything with this. You lied to me. Now, if she decides to return the gold and get her money back, I'll do that. If she wants to call my manager, the regional vice president, and tell them that I'm the rudest man in the world, I make my days, my weeks, 
my months, my quarter, and my year. My boss is never going to believe that I was rude to somebody. She's going to think it was a misinterpretation of something or this woman was just having a bad day. So I know I'm safe in what I want to do. I take it in my hand and I clench my fist around it, except that instead of me being able to tell her these things, my store and my mall completely disappear. They're gone. I'm standing in a darkened void and it's me and this woman. Her name is Marianne Wickman and she's Father Joseph Whalen's personal assistant in the St. Raphael Healing Oil Ministry. And she tells me about the magic spell I did last night and that's of the devil. And I've helped split over 100 churches and that's of the devil. And I've committed over 100 abortions and that's of the devil. And she tells me about eight or nine other sins and all of them end with, and that's of the devil. Now, when this first started, I wanted to attack her with magic, but currently her magic is stronger than mine. Let's go back to, I could have been the only one high wizard. I did not have the magical power to give somebody a worthless gold colored piece of tin, transport both of us to a darkened void and know all their sins. She'll kill me with magic. I, I can't attack her, but I can't escape either. What happens if I drop the metal and then I just fall through this darkened void and never find my way back to my mall, back to my store? I don't know what to do. I mean, I'm starting to sweat. I'm terrified. This woman, this woman is scaring me bad. And she says again, the Blessed Mother is calling you into her army. And instantly, I knew that was the Mother of God. It had to be a grace by the Holy Spirit. And when I knew it was the Mother of God, Mary showed up. She was the prettiest woman I've ever seen in my life. And she smiled at me. And it's a smile that I knew I did not deserve. I was acutely aware of my 146 assisted abortions. And she took me by the hand, the hand that had the metal in it. And she turned me around. And Divine Mercy Jesus was standing behind me. But I didn't know what Divine Mercy was. I just knew I had these rays of light that were shooting above me and under me and around me and through me. And in that instant, I knew I did not sell my soul to the devil when I was 13 years old. I knew that Jesus Christ was my Lord and Savior. I knew that all my magic, my occult, my new age, and my Satanism was false. And I knew beyond a reasonable doubt that everything Catholic was truth. And the Blessed Mother told me that my job was to help her end abortion. And I opened my hand and I was back in my store back in my mall and this woman Marianne Wickman is still talking to me and she tells me that she is Father Joseph Whalen's personal assistant and he is the busiest priest she knows he doesn't even have time to talk to her and she's the personal assistant and while she's talking to me her cell phone rings and she looks at it she says this is Father Joe I've got to take this call wait you just explained all that yeah go ahead take it so at that time, Father Joe was starting to go deaf. So when he talked, he talked like everybody else was going deaf. And he says, can they hand the phone to the young man you're talking to? She's like, certainly, Father Joe. And she hands me the cell phone. I heard everything he said. I'm shaking like Ozzy Osbourne. You know, I like take the phone. I'm like, hello? Welcome to the faith. Hand the phone back to Marianne. I hand the phone back to her. He hung up on her. And then we got two more phone calls similar to that. She sent her daughter out to the truck and said, bring this man one of each of everything. So the daughter runs out all happy and giddy. And I don't know what one of each of everything is. I'm not Catholic. And her daughter comes back in with a paper grocery bag filled with pamphlets. Why do Catholics believe this or do that? A Catholic Bible and like 125 Lighthouse Catholic media discs. You know, and I'm like, oh, this is incredible. Okay. And then she tells me where she goes to mass. 
and she gives me the address. And so the very next day, I started going to daily mass. And I thought, I had been to two black masses in my life. They didn't make any sense to me because they were nothing like a Baptist church service. Suddenly, when I'm at this mass, I realize what the black mass is a parody of. It's this. This is what was going on, but a parody of this. And now it made more sense. When I went home, at that time I was married, and my wife had grown up Jehovah's Witness. So they were very anti-Catholic. She was no longer that. She was very new age with me. And I opened the door, my wife was inside doing the dishes, and I walked in and I said, honey, guess what? I'm Catholic now. And she stopped doing the dishes and she said, of all the things you could possibly be, why on earth would you do that? But the next day when I went to mass, she went with me. She supported me through my journey. She was going to daily mass with me the very first mass I went to. At the consecration, I saw Jesus. And I thought all the Catholics in the room could see that. I didn't realize that was a special gift to me. I thought if you're Catholic, you see that. I thought I was Catholic because I was given that medal. Boom, everything Catholic's truth. All my stuff is fake and false. Clearly I'm Catholic. I see Jesus, same as everybody else. Even though I believed that I had sold my soul to the devil and couldn't go to God, even if I wanted to, that I had been forgiven. And I'd been forgiven through divine mercy. That Jesus was letting me know that I didn't sell my soul to the devil. That I can become Catholic. I can be a Christian if I want to. You know, and this was my route in. The, the biggest, the, this is how much God orchestrates things. I worked in the day. I worked in that day in the mall. So that, that woman, Marianne Wickman, could give me the medal. I started going to daily mass the next day and saw Jesus up on the altar and thought, this is the biggest secret for me in the world. If I'd have known when I was a kid that Jesus was legitimately in the Catholic Church, I would have entered the Catholic Church and nobody could have drugged me out. You might have had to have made me a priest so I could leave. I, wasn't, I, I was just flabbergasted, to use one of my dad's old words, that Jesus is really there. Like, I'd been told there all the Catholics were going to hell. And here it is. I'm not. You know, I'm forgiven. You know, all my sins don't mean that much. You know, like, God loves me enough to come get me, to come to where I am, and to meet me there, but to raise me up in holiness. You know, my Baptist church never did that. You know, this was, this was an incredible event to me. You know, I found out at church, I've been to a few of the, a few of the masses and found out there was a place called Perpetual Adoration where I could go see Jesus any time. And I thought, you know, I've seen Pink Floyd in concert four times. One of the times was at a stadium that had probably 90,000 people. It took seven hours to get inside and get to your seats. It took longer than that to leave. Going to see God has got to be bigger than any rock star. You know, there's a line to get in to see Elvis. And he's been dead for 40 years. There has to be a line. There has to be a sign-up sheet. Like, do you sign up and then they call you in a few months or a few years and tell you, it's your turn? And they said, no, you just go. It's no big deal. Just go. So they gave me the address. I went to that church. And shock number one, we're the only other car in the parking lot. Shock number two, there's no line to get in. And shock number three, we open the door to the chapel and it's me, my wife, Jesus, and this woman. This woman looks up like a deer in the headlights and she packs her bags as fast as she can go. I mean, if this was an Olympic event, 
she got gold. And then she says, you can't leave till someone else comes in and bam, she's out the door. And I thought, why would I leave? I'm in a room with Jesus. When I was a Satanist, I was so judgmental. I mean, I, you know, I never met a holy Baptist church. You know, the reason we didn't attack any of the other churches, because Satan only attacks those churches that do him harm. So going back to my description of the three houses, you have a house that attacks the Baptist church, a house that attacks the Catholic church, which I couldn't understand why, because I knew all the Catholics were going to hell. And then the final house creates um, media for like atheistic, um, socialism, um, new age religions. You know, it's just Satan constantly writing, putting out papers, music, books, um, videos, anything on any of those subjects because he doesn't necessarily want you to worship him. He just does not want you to worship God. So if you're not worshiping God, you're going to hell. So, you know, it's got, and like I said, you have these three houses. So going back to, I'm going to adoration for all this time. Um, I went to um, St. Raphael Healing Oil Ministry. We're trying to find me a spiritual director. And they found me, Father Anthony Gramlich. He's the rector of the National Shrine of Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And they scheduled me an appointment to go see him. And so before we sat down and spoke, he gave me a tour of the shrine. And I saw this massive picture of Divine Mercy Jesus. And there was somebody standing next to me I didn't even know. And I said, that's Jesus. And she said, duh. I said, no, that's the Jesus I saw. That's, I, that's Jesus. I, I don't even know what those rays of light are. And for some reason, St. Raphael thought that Father Anthony would be the perfect spiritual director because I saw Divine Mercy Jesus not knowing what Divine Mercy was. I didn't even know it was called Divine Mercy Jesus. And they knew Father Anthony. So they take me there and I see, like Father Anthony takes me into the chapel and I'm going to all these relics. And he said that I went in the order of, he says, all saints are holy. He said, but I went in the order probably of holiness around the room to each one of the relics. And then we sat down and we talked for three hours. And so he was my first spiritual director and still is in a, in a lot of ways. But having no idea what divine mercy was and my gosh, I was so judgmental. I, I was like, I was like Satan. I was like the great accuser. You did anything wrong in your life, I would point it out. You know, I didn't care if you stopped. I wasn't trying to make you drop to your knees and beg for forgiveness and all that. I was just pointing out, you know, you're doing this, right? You know, this is wrong, right? You know, this is what, you know, you're going to hell for this, you know, and it was just a funny comment to me for me to make. But when I became Catholic, yeah, and for me, the, the first milestone to become a Catholic was being given the medal. I really felt like I was Catholic then, even though, you know, when I went back to my, the priest that was bringing me into the church, I explained that I might need, because Father Anthony told me I at least needed a deliverance and I might need an exorcism. And I talked to Monsignor Lavalle. There's a picture of him on the other side of that wall. And... He said, you know, you're sitting in front of the Blessed Sacrament for 18 hours a day. There's no demon willing to do that. He says, and I want to go out on a limb and say that whatever demon might have been attached to you at the moment of your conversion, they got the hell scared out of them when Mary and Jesus showed up. So he said he would prefer, he would perform a deliverance on me, but he didn't think I needed an exorcism. And I didn't realize that I had satanic gifts at that moment. 
But I did. And when I had my deliverance, I lost my satanic gifts, which was a blessing to me because I didn't like them. I didn't like them when I was a Satanist. I, had, I could see demons and angels. You know, demons are kind of creepy, but I thought the demons were there to keep me safe and the angels were there to do me harm. I didn't realize until after I was Catholic that the angels were there to keep me safe and the demons were there to keep me damned. And I think people recognize truth when they hear it. You know, there are some people that don't. You know, Protestants don't believe, really, Protestants will protest me at some of my talks. But, you know, I also speak out, you know, the devil doesn't attack anybody that doesn't do him harm. That's why we never attacked a single Protestant church except the Baptists. And in the 90s, we stopped attacking them. And you know who's consistently attacked? Us. The Catholics, our attack doesn't stop. You know, and it's because we do the devil the most harm. You know, he wants to, to bring us, our church down. You know, surely he's read the Bible, you know, as, as well as the rest of us, you know, and knows that the gates of hell will not prevail. But that doesn't stop him. You know, and he's not, I think at this point, he's not really trying to destroy us. He's just trying to keep as many away from the kingdom of heaven as he can. And he does a fairly good job of that. You know, I mean, he's not perfect and he's not almighty and he, you know, he's not as powerful as God. I mean, that's something I think a lot of people need to understand. He's a creature. He's a little higher than us, but he's not anywhere. It's not an equal battle. He's not bat battling his brother Jesus. You know, it's nothing like that. You know, it's just a creature that has a little too much ego, got a little too big for his britches and thought he could do it. You know, my one of my biggest... Um, points that I like to, to say about the Catholic Church when you're comparing them to another church. When Satanists go to steal the host, they don't steal the Baptist Wonder Bread. How hard would it be to go into a Protestant church and take their host? It's not hard at all. You could probably walk in there, grab a handful, and run out the door, and no one would care. But ours is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And who else knows that besides Catholics? Satan. And Satan gets Satanists to steal that host and then sell it for between $1,500 and $15,000, with the average price being about $5,000. Because you've got to give your, your silver pieces for Jesus. Now, why would... I mean, it seems insane that somebody would pay $5,000, oh, let's just go with the cheapest price, $1,500 for a piece of bread. Come on. Unless it's legitimately God. And then it's believable. Satan believes it's God. How come 87% of Catholics don't believe that? Uh, my job, I feel my job in this ministry is to tell people to flee from the devil and run towards God. If you flee from the devil and run towards God, I'm not saying your life is going to be simple because it's not. The closer you get to God, the more Satan hates you. You know, have you ever noticed that on the day that you're going to confession, nothing is going wrong until you decide to go to confession? And then everything goes wrong. Suddenly your tire is flat. You run out of gas. Your son or daughter or niece or nephew or wife is mad at you and wants to have a conversation right now when you were just on your way to confession. And if you don't go right now, you're going to miss it. You know, and if you don't go to confession, you're going to miss mass because, you know, you can go and you can get the grace of sitting there, but you can't take the Eucharist. You know, I, I, I preach the, um, the true presence. You know, the, the greatest gifts that Jesus gave us was the Eucharist, confession, and his mother. You know, and I don't change. Those stories don't change. You know, I tell people to always, I tell people to go to confession every seven days. You know, that if you don't need confession every seven days, praise God. Go in and get a blessing because everybody could use a blessing. Always be in the middle of a novena. You know, if you can be in a novena when Jesus comes back, won't that be wonderful? You know, what are you doing? I'm in the middle of a novena. Oh, I'll let you finish. You know, 
anything you can do. Read the Bible every day. You know, do what you need to do to stay in a state of grace as often as you can. As soon as you know you're not in a state of grace, go get in one. Because if you died on the way to confession, your act of contrition better be perfect or you're going to find yourself not in heaven and not in purgatory. Our goal is to get to heaven. That's the end goal. You've got, you've got to do what it takes to get you there. And you've got to try and be as holy as you can. You're not just trying to get yourself there. Don't be selfish and just think, it's all about me. I'm, the, I'm number one. You've got a spouse. You've got friends. You've got relatives. You want to see everybody get there. You know, and tell everybody, you know, there's saints. You have favorite saints. You have your, your saint, you know, whoever that might be. And, you know, you want to rely on all these people to help you. You know, I rely on the Blessed Mother the most, but I have a whole litany of saints that I pray to. You know, I pray for a lot of people in purgatory every day. I have 36 people that I pray for in purgatory every day. And I don't know if they're there, but I was told by another priest that if you pray for somebody in purgatory and they're really in hell, it causes them pain. So at the end of my list, I say, and if any of these people are not in purgatory, then please give their prayers to people that need to come out next. So hopefully I'm covering a lot of people. When I do the, um, the blessing of my food, at the end of my prayer for that, I say, all saints, please pray for us. And it's exciting for me because let's say there's a billion people in heaven right now. There's got to be more, but there's a billion people in heaven right now. But tomorrow there might be a billion and one. Ten days from now there might be a billion and ten. That number is constantly going up. So every time I say, all saints pray for us, that number increases. And I need all those prayers that I can get. You know, I put out a book and a CD set called Abortion is a Satanic Sacrifice. When I was in adoration one of the times, I told Jesus, I've got, you know, your mother told me my job was to help her end abortion. But I don't know how. I can only stop myself from doing them. And he told me to wait a minute. A couple of minutes later, Blessed Mother showed up in adoration. She said, very simple, very short. Use what you know. And she was gone. I know abortion is a satanic sacrifice. So I did a CD set. And I put that out. A lot of people ask for the transcript of the CD set. So I put out a book. Now, my book has a few stories in it that don't appear in the CD set. And there's also, um, in the final two pages of the book, is an endorsement from Father Frank Pavone. And as well, if you find my website, there's a picture of Father Frank Pavone holding my book and my CD set. And there's an endorsement on my website for my ministry from him. And it, it, it's, a, it's an incredible thing. We hear that so far we've shut down 49 abortion clinics around the world, um, a large number of them in Louisiana and Texas. And the average abortion clinic, according to Planned Parenthood, they do 1,500 abortions a year. So take 1,500 times 49, and that's how many babies I save every year. And that is a mighty good feeling. When I had everything in a satanic community, my $87 million wasn't mine. My Lamborghini wasn't mine. My mansions weren't mine. You know, Satan believes in use your illusion, make people think this is all yours. This is, you have everything. You're on top of the world, but you don't have anything. Now, divine mercy gave me salvation. If I died tomorrow and you know, I'm not the richest man in the world. I'm not probably not even the richest man in this room. But I have salvation. If I die in a state of grace, 
I'm going to purgatory. And, you know, I know that there's a lot of wasted suffering in the world, but not right here. All my suffering, I offer up. I'm missing my right foot. I'm diabetic. I'm on dialysis. I'm blind. You know, I have everything. I explained to you that the, the secret to getting everything you want is that everything you want is what God wants for you. Now, I probably don't have everything that God wants for me, but I will eventually. I have a, a quote that I'm prone to say in pretty much all my talks and all my interviews. And you don't really necessarily have to remember anything about me personally, but remember this quote. You cannot sell what you do not own. In my talks, I ask people, I usually have an assistant sitting next to me, and I ask them what kind of car they own, and can anyone in the audience legally sell me their car? And everybody agrees, no, you can't sell the car. Why not? Because they don't own it. I said, that's the same reason you can't sell your soul. You don't own it. You may have heard God died for you. Jesus paid the ultimate price for your soul. You don't own it. You can't loan it. You can't lease it. And you certainly can't sell it. You may have heard that the devil's a liar. I'm here to confirm. You can't believe anything he says. If the devil says good morning, get a second opinion. 